Welcome to Certification Terminal. As part of this series, we will discuss a couple of CompTIA Security Plus certification exam questions and answers. How do we refer to spam messages sent via internet messaging platforms? Option A, two face timing. Option B, I am spam. Option C, SM spam. Option D, SBIM. The correct answer is Option D, SBIM. SBIM stands for Spam Over Instant Messaging. It specifically refers to unsolicited messages sent through internet messaging platforms, making it the most appropriate choice among the options provided. Option A, two face timing, is incorrect. Two face timing is not a commonly used term to refer to spam messages on internet messaging platforms. It appears to be a play on the term FaceTime, which is a brand name for Apple's video calling service. Option B, I am spam, is incorrect. While I am spam seems intuitive as an abbreviation for instant messaging spam, it's not a widely recognized term compared to SBM. Additionally, I am spam doesn't adhere to the conventional naming convention for spam over instant messaging platforms. Option C, SM spam, is incorrect. SM spam seems to be a combination of SMS, short message service, and spam. While SMS spam exists, it typically refers to unsolicited text messages sent via mobile phone networks, not specifically through internet messaging platforms. Next question. What method is used to assess the value of assets? Option A, the cost to replace the item. Option B, the depreciated cost of the item. Option C, the original cost of the item. Option D, any of the above based on organizational preference. The correct answer is, option D, any of the above based on organizational preference. Different organizations may use various methods to assess the value of assets based on their specific needs, preferences, and accounting practices. Therefore, any of the methods mentioned in the options, cost to replace the item, depreciated cost of the item, or original cost of the item, could be valid depending on the organization's policies and requirements. Some organizations may prefer to use the cost to replace the item, while others may opt for the depreciated cost or the original cost. It ultimately depends on factors such as the nature of the assets, industry standards, regulatory requirements, and management preferences. Option A, the cost to replace the item, is incorrect. While the cost to replace an item is a valid method for assessing the value of assets, it may not always be the preferred or most practical approach for every organization. Some organizations may prioritize other factors, such as historical cost or depreciation when evaluating asset value. Therefore, this option is incorrect as it does not encompass all possible methods. Option B, the depreciated cost of the item, is incorrect. While the depreciated cost of an item is commonly used to determine asset value, it may not be the exclusive method used by all organizations. Some organizations may use other valuation methods, depending on their accounting principles, industry standards, or specific circumstances. Therefore, this option is incorrect as it does not encompass all possible methods. Option C, the original cost of the item, is incorrect. Using the original cost of an item as the sole method for assessing asset value is a straightforward approach but it may not always reflect the current value or condition of the asset accurately. Additionally, some organizations may prefer to consider factors such as depreciation or replacement cost in their asset valuation process. Next question, which protocol is optimal for deploying a single sign-on solution across numerous cloud-based services within a large organization, simplifying user authentication for access to all associated services? Option A, LDAP. Option B, OAuth. Option C, OpenID. Option D, SAML. The correct answer is, Option D, Security Assertion Markup Language, SAML. Security Assertion Markup Language, SAML, is the optimal protocol for deploying a single sign-on solution across numerous cloud-based services within a large organization. SAML allows for the exchange of authentication and authorization data between identity providers and service providers, enabling users to authenticate once and access multiple services without needing to re-enter credentials. 
It's widely adopted for enterprise SSO solutions and offers robust security features. Option A, LDAP, is incorrect. Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, LDAP, is a protocol used for accessing and managing directory information. While LDAP can be part of an authentication infrastructure, it is not typically used for SSO across cloud-based services. LDAP is more commonly used for centralized user authentication and directory services, but does not provide the necessary mechanisms for SSO across disparate services. Option B, OAuth, is incorrect. Open Authorization, OAuth, is a protocol for authorization, not authentication. While OAuth is commonly used for delegated authorization scenarios, such as allowing applications to access user data on other services, it is not designed for SSO. OAuth lacks the features necessary for securely exchanging authentication data between identity providers and service providers, which is essential for SSO solutions. Option C, OpenID, is incorrect. OpenID is an open standard and decentralized authentication protocol that allows users to be authenticated by certain co-operating sites using a third-party service. While OpenID facilitates single sign-on, it's not as widely adopted or as standardized for enterprise SSO solutions as SAML. SAML offers more comprehensive support for enterprise use cases and has stronger industry support and interoperability. Therefore, while OpenID can be used for SSO, SAML is often preferred for enterprise deployments. Next question, what is considered a recommended approach for enhancing the security of a web application? Option A, implementing strong session management techniques. Option B, storing user credentials in plain text. Option C, allowing unrestricted file uploads. Option D, disabling input validation. The correct answer is, option A, implementing strong session management techniques. Implementing strong session management techniques is indeed a recommended approach for enhancing the security of a web application. Strong session management involves measures such as using secure cookies, implementing session expiration and timeout mechanisms, employing secure communication channels, and implementing proper session token handling to prevent session hijacking and fixation attacks. By ensuring robust session management, web applications can better protect user sessions and sensitive data. Option B, storing user credentials in plain text is incorrect. Storing user credentials in plain text is a highly insecure practice and is strongly discouraged in web application security. It exposes user passwords to potential theft in the event of a data breach or unauthorized access. Storing passwords securely, such as using salted and hashed representations, is considered a best practice whereas storing them in plain text is a significant security vulnerability. Option C, allowing unrestricted file uploads is incorrect. Allowing unrestricted file uploads can pose significant security risks to a web application as it opens the door to various attacks, such as file upload vulnerabilities, malicious file execution, and malware distribution. Implementing proper validation and restrictions on file uploads, such as file type verification, size limitations, and malware scanning is essential for mitigating these risks. Allowing unrestricted file uploads is not a recommended approach for enhancing security. Rather, it introduces vulnerabilities. Option D, disabling input validation, is incorrect. Disabling input validation removes an essential layer of defense against common web application security threats, such as injection attacks, example, SQL injection, cross-site scripting. Input validation helps ensure that user-provided data is properly sanitized and conforms to expected formats, reducing the risk of injection attacks and other security vulnerabilities. Disabling input validation is not a recommended approach for enhancing security. Rather, it weakens the application's resilience to attacks. Next question. Bob, during his penetration test, has established control over a web server within the target organization and is now endeavoring to leverage it to gain entry into a file server on the internal network. Which phase of the penetration testing process does this correspond to? Option A, reconnaissance. Option B, pivot. Option C, initial exploitation. Option D, scoping. The correct answer is, option B, pivot. 
In the penetration testing process, pivoting refers to the stage where an attacker, having gained initial access to one system, attempts to use that access to further penetrate the network and access other systems, such as the file server, within the target organization's internal network. During this phase, the attacker seeks to extend their foothold and exploit the compromised system's position to access additional resources. Next question. As a network administrator responsible for configuring the firewall for the company's internal file server, Bob identifies that TCP port 445 is open to external traffic, which is against the organization's security policies. What should Bob do to uphold recommended security protocols? Option A, block port 445 for external traffic. Option B, close port 445 entirely. Option C, redirect external requests from port 445 to port 80. Option D, open port 443 instead of 445. The correct answer is, option A, block port 445 for external traffic. Blocking port 445 for external traffic is the appropriate action for Bob to uphold recommended security protocols. Since TCP port 445 should not be accessible from outside the company, according to the organization's security policies, Bob should configure the firewall to prevent external traffic from accessing port 445. This ensures that the file server remains protected from unauthorized access while allowing internal users to continue using SMB for file sharing within the network. Option B, close port 445 entirely, is incorrect. Closing port 445 entirely would prevent both internal and external traffic from accessing it. However, since the requirement is to allow internal file sharing, while restricting external access, closing port 445 entirely would disrupt internal file sharing operations. Option C, redirect external requests from port 445 to port 80 is incorrect. Redirecting external requests from port 445 to port 80 is not a suitable solution for this scenario. Port 80 is commonly used for HTTP traffic and redirecting external traffic from port 445 to port 80 would likely disrupt normal HTTP operations and could introduce security risks. Additionally, this solution does not align with the requirement to restrict external access to port 445. Option D, open port 443 instead of 445, is incorrect. Opening port 443 instead of port 445 is not a suitable solution for this scenario. Port 443 is commonly used for HTTPS traffic and opening it instead of port 445 would not address the requirement to restrict external access to port 445. Additionally, opening port 443 may introduce security risks if there is no legitimate need for it to be open. Next question, which group mentioned below is typically not a part of an organization's cybersecurity incident response team? Option A, technical subject matter experts. Option B, cybersecurity experts. Option C, law enforcement. Option D, management. The correct answer is, option C, law enforcement. Law enforcement is typically not a part of an organization's cybersecurity incident response team. While technical subject matter experts, cybersecurity experts, and management are integral components of the incident response team, law enforcement agencies are usually involved in the event of a significant cyber incident, especially those involving criminal activity. However, they are not typically part of the internal incident response team within an organization. Option A, technical subject matter experts, is incorrect. Technical subject matter experts are often crucial members of an organization's cybersecurity incident response team. They possess specialized knowledge and skills related to the organization's technical infrastructure, systems, and applications. They play a vital role in identifying, analyzing, and mitigating cybersecurity incidents. Option B, cybersecurity experts, is incorrect. Cybersecurity experts are essential members of an organization's cybersecurity incident response team. They are responsible for overseeing and coordinating the response to cybersecurity incidents, providing expertise on cybersecurity best practices, threat intelligence, and incident detection and response strategies. Option D, management, is incorrect. Management, including executives and senior leaders, is typically involved in overseeing 
and guiding the organization's cybersecurity incident response efforts. They play a critical role in decision-making, resource allocation, communication with stakeholders, and ensuring that incident response efforts align with organizational goals and objectives. Next question. What is the primary role of security information and event management tools in operational security? Option A, conducting vulnerability assessments. Option B, encrypting network traffic. Option C, monitoring and analyzing security events. Option D, configuring access controls. The correct answer is, option C, monitoring and analyzing security events. Security information and event management tools primarily serve the role of monitoring and analyzing security events within operational security. These tools collect and aggregate data from various sources such as network devices, servers, applications, and security controls. They then analyze this data in real-time or near real-time to identify security incidents, threats, and anomalies. SIEM tools provide features like log management, correlation, alerting, and reporting to help organizations detect, investigate, and respond to security events effectively. Option A, conducting vulnerability assessments, is incorrect. While vulnerability assessments are an essential component of operational security, they are distinct from the primary role of SIEM tools. Vulnerability assessments involve identifying and assessing weaknesses in systems, networks, and applications to proactively mitigate risks. While some SIEM tools may integrate with vulnerability assessment tools or provide limited vulnerability scanning capabilities, their primary function is not to conduct vulnerability assessments. Option B, encrypting network traffic is incorrect. Encrypting network traffic is an important security measure to protect data confidentiality during transmission. However, this function is typically performed by encryption protocols, network security appliances, such as firewalls and VPNs, and secure communication protocols, such as TLS and SSL. While SIEM tools may analyze encrypted network traffic for security events, their primary role is not to encrypt network traffic. Option D, configuring access controls, is incorrect. Configuring access controls involves setting permissions and restrictions on who can access specific resources within an organization's IT environment. While access controls are a vital aspect of operational security, configuring access controls is not the primary role of SIEM tools. Access control configurations are typically managed through identity and access management systems, directory services, and network security policies. Next question, what is the main concept denoted by ownership in the realm of asset management? Option A, the vendor from whom the asset was purchased. Option B, the individual who uses the asset. Option C, the IT department. Option D, the individual or department responsible for the asset security and maintenance. The correct answer is, option D, the individual or department responsible for the asset security and maintenance. In the realm of asset management, the concept denoted by ownership primarily refers to the individual or department responsible for the asset security and maintenance. This includes overseeing the asset's life cycle, ensuring compliance with organizational policies and regulations, and managing risks associated with the asset. Ownership involves accountability for the asset's well-being, including its protection, maintenance, and efficient utilization. Option A is incorrect. While the vendor from whom the asset was purchased is involved in the procurement process, they do not typically represent the concept of ownership in asset management. Ownership pertains to the entity within the organization responsible for the ongoing security, maintenance, and management of the asset, which is distinct from the vendor's role in the procurement process. Option B is incorrect. While the individual who uses the asset may have a role in its utilization, they do not necessarily represent ownership in asset management. Ownership entails broader responsibilities, such as security, maintenance, and life cycle management, which extend beyond the scope of individual usage. Option C is incorrect. While the IT department may be involved in managing assets, ownership typically transcends departmental boundaries and may be assigned to specific individuals or teams within the organization. Ownership is more closely associated with responsibility and accountability for the asset's security, maintenance, and management. 
rather than being solely attributed to the IT department. Next question. As Amanda tries to transition from an on-premises infrastructure to a hybrid cloud setup, what aspects she must consider that weren't relevant in a single on-premises data center? Option A, RTOs. Option B, power resilience. Option C, data sovereignty. Option D, RPOs. The correct answer is, option C, data sovereignty. When transitioning from an on-premises infrastructure to a hybrid cloud setup, data sovereignty becomes a significant consideration that wasn't relevant in a single on-premises data center. Data sovereignty refers to the legal requirements and regulations governing where data is stored, processed, and transmitted. In a hybrid cloud environment, data may be stored across multiple locations, including on-premises infrastructure and cloud servers located in various regions or countries. Therefore, Amanda must consider data sovereignty laws and regulations to ensure compliance with data protection and privacy requirements, especially when data crosses national borders. Option A, RTOs, is incorrect. Recovery time objectives, RTOs, refer to the maximum acceptable downtime for restoring services after a disruption. While RTOs are essential considerations in disaster recovery planning, they are relevant in both on-premises and hybrid cloud environments. Therefore, RTOs are not specific to hybrid cloud transitions and do not differentiate between the two scenarios. Option B, power resilience, is incorrect. Power resilience, which refers to the ability of infrastructure to withstand power outages or failures, is a critical consideration in both on-premises and hybrid cloud environments. It ensures continuous availability and uptime of IT services. While power resilience may involve different configurations or redundancies in each environment, it remains a relevant consideration regardless of the deployment model. Option D, RPOs, is incorrect. Recovery point objectives, RPOs, refer to the acceptable data loss threshold in the event of a disruption. Similar to RTOs, RPOs are essential considerations in disaster recovery planning and are relevant in both on-premises and hybrid cloud environments. They dictate how frequently data backups or replication must occur to meet recovery objectives. Therefore, RPOs are not unique to hybrid cloud transitions and do not differentiate between the two scenarios. Next question. According to the analysis conducted by a security analyst in response to reports of unauthorized activities and suspicious emails from user accounts, what type of attack is presumed to be the cause, considering factors such as shared workstations, disabled endpoint protection, and anomalous login activity? Option A, brute force. Option B, rainbow attack. Option C, keylogger. Option D, dictionary attack. The correct answer is, option C, keylogger. Based on the analysis conducted by the security analyst and considering the observed factors, such as shared workstations, disabled endpoint protection, and anomalous login activity, the most likely type of attack presumed to be, the cause is a keylogger attack. A keylogger is malicious software or hardware that records keystrokes on a computer or device without the user's knowledge. Keyloggers can capture sensitive information, including usernames, passwords, and other credentials entered by users. In this scenario, the presence of shared workstations increases the likelihood of a keylogger being installed surreptitiously to capture keystrokes from multiple users. Additionally, disabled endpoint protection may have facilitated the installation and operation of the keylogger. Option A, brute force, is incorrect. A brute force attack involves systematically attempting all possible combinations of passwords until the correct one is found. While it's possible for a brute force attack to compromise user accounts, the observed factors such as shared workstations and disabled endpoint protection are not indicative of a brute force attack. Brute force attacks are more commonly associated with repeated login attempts rather than anomalous login activity. Option B, rainbow attack, is incorrect. A rainbow attack is a type of password cracking technique that uses pre-computed tables to crack password hashes. However, the observed factors, such as shared workstations and disabled endpoint protection, do not align with the characteristics of a rainbow attack. Rainbow attacks typically target password hashes rather than capturing keystrokes directly, as would be expected in this scenario. 
Option D, dictionary attack, is incorrect. A dictionary attack involves using a predefined list of commonly used passwords to attempt to gain unauthorized access to user accounts. While it's plausible for a dictionary attack to be used in this scenario, the observed factors such as shared workstations and disabled endpoint protection suggest a more sophisticated attack vector, such as a keylogger. Additionally, the anomalous login activity may not align with the typical pattern of a dictionary attack. Thank you very much for watching. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel if these questions add value to your preparation. We'll meet in the next video. Take care until then.